Organizations that are actually using, trying to create their own LLM models or generative AI or machine learning, they are really focusing on that challenge of what data do I have, who has access to it, and what are they doing with it? So starting with an AI inventory, a data inventory, and marrying those two up to say, right, do people have access to personal data and are they using it to create and train models, et cetera? And do we have the right controls on to restrict access so that people don't you know, leverage all our personal information that we hold on behalf of our customers to create new models? Hi, this is Joseph Sapin Bharatiya and welcome to TFR Let's Talk. Today we have with us Claude Mendy, Chief Evangelist at Symmetry Systems. Claude, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here and to share some of my knowledge. Yeah, and today we are going to talk about AI in the whole enterprise space. But before we go deeper into this topic of today, today's, since this is the first time I'm talking to somebody from Symmetry Systems, so I would like to hear a bit about the company itself. What do you folks do? We are a modern data security company. So we are a Series B startup that uh, started out of UT Austin. So we, we're heavily backed by a lot of research into the space about how to protect your data. So, you know, very focused on data flow and ensuring that organizations have the right visibility into what data they have, who has access to that data and what they're doing with it. A lot of organizations aren't able to answer those questions right now, so they operate in the blind. So we aim to provide that visibility and then the actionability on top of that to remediate some of those issues and wrap protection around that to, to give them comfort that their data that they're holding on behalf of consumers or their intellectual property is um, adequately protected within their organization, which is a big problem in the modern world with all the different types of threats and attackers that you, you have around. Can you also talk about other areas where we talk about, of course, digital sovereignties there. You know, Europe is very, very, you know, California, you've also, folks have laws around data privacy. So talk a bit about not just you know doing the right thing but a lot of legal framework uh, regulations where companies do need to have such tools or practices in place the data privacy kind of regimes are, are quite increasing and very um becoming more modern much like gdpr has kind of put the footprint down on you know data sovereignty there's other countries that are trying to keep pace with that to allow the data to flow across countries and provide citizens with the same rights. So the data sovereignty kind of rights are, are really about making sure that countries give their citizens the same rights that they would expect them to have over their data in their country when it kind of goes across those rights. There's also kind of uh, a couple of other quite nuanced terms that are very si similar. So data residency, that's kind of just about keeping data that is created in a country in that country. So there's some countries that have enforced that, that makes sure that data that's created there stays in there. So China, for example, India has a very similar data residency kind of component. So all these laws kind of really are starting to focus on data, where it is, who has access to it, who has rights to, to kind of move it. Uh, the modern ones that come out of CCPA are providing those rights on, onwards to their citizens to make sure that they can actually get that visibility on who has access to that data, what are companies doing with it, who, uh, who are that. So it's all very kind of related to do people have the right insight into what's happening with their data, whether it's in an organization or across borders and, and things like that. As we were trying to tame, you know, you mentioned GDPR and all those things, we try to tame data. Suddenly somebody threw uh, an AI wrench in there and they're like, now hold my beer. So talk about what kind of challenges, risks, AI, genetic AI, LLMs are creating for not only organizations, because now suddenly uh, it's like uh, opening a can of worms there uh, to deal with it. And then from your perspective, how do you look at these challenges and are we ready to actually mitigate those? I love the, the kind of concept of throwing a wrench in there. But what that wrench has done is actually speeded up things so, so much faster and kind of opened up this uh, opportunity as well. So it's, it's both this threat that's coming and this opportunity for organizations to get quicker and faster at leveraging their, their data and kind of enabling that. The challenge for that is, you know, the data that you train these models on uh, is the starting point for any kind of AI pipeline or use of uh, AI, especially in the large language models. You have to have something to train your data on, 
or your, your models on to be able to create those outputs that are so mind boggling and be able to answer questions that you throw at them or prompts that you throw at them to generate new things. Now, whatever you throw into that data that you train it on is going to come out in some way further down the track or can possibly come through. So that's the biggest challenge for these organizations that are jumping in on the LLM bandwagon from a privacy or data perspective is they don't necessarily know what the model was trained on um, or they don't have control of what's in that data or visibility of what's in that data that they're training these new LLM models on. So they get surprised when all of a sudden it pops out, oh, this person's date of birth is et cetera. And they're like, whoa, we didn't provide that, but maybe they did in the, the, the data that they provided. So those are some of the, the challenges that they, they're struggling with at the very start is they don't know what data is going into these LLM models or what has gone into them or what data that they're providing. The other big concern I, I'll, I'll kind of just raise is for a lot of people, you know, the democratization of having all this new power, this you know, chat GPT at their fingertips for people like myself, like you, uh, it gives them great um, capability to optimize their work very quickly. What could have taken me two days to write a blog, I can probably do in 20 minutes now with LLM as a starting point. Now that is just through prompts and working through that. And the challenge with that is now to get that data or that final output right, I really need to use a lot of more uh, kind of prompts. And if I was, you know, probably not as privacy conscious, I might start throwing in customer names, customer details about that. And that opens a whole bunch of new data privacy concerns because I'm sharing private information with an LLM model that I have no contractual relationship with because it's chat GPT open for free to everyone. Uh, so that's the second part of it is the democratization of LLMs to the general public and allowing people to do that, uh, to access it and use it, et cetera, with no control about what data they put in it. So that's the two challenges facing organizations. One is creating new LLM models, what data they're using to train it. And for consumers or you know, the, the staff of companies, what, what are they providing? What are they using when they're using LLMs for their private purposes or for um, company purposes? without the right level of control. So that's where the two concerns around privacy are mainly coming from at the moment. How do you see mostly organizations are kind of reacting or responding to uh, this threat of you know, data privacy through AI? I think we've seen a range of responses from the, we shall block everything LLM till we figure that out. You know, the, the AI sports, uh, space force ban, where they said, well, we're going to block access to chat GPT and LLMs until we can put the right controls on it. Um, other ones have started more of the educational side. So we can allow them to do it, but we're going to focus on educating people on what they can and can't do um, with the, the chat GPTs of the world. Um, that's tackling that second challenge, which is my cons customers, my users, et cetera. What are they actually doing in, with chat GP? What are they putting in there? Um, between those two, you get people who are investing in tools to, to kind of wrap some control around it and monitoring, et cetera. But those are the two extremes I see on that side. Uh, for organizations that are actually using, trying to create their own LLM models or generative AI or machine learning, they are really focusing on that challenge of what data do I have, who has access to it, and what are they doing with it? So starting with an AI inventory, a data inventory, and marrying those two up to say, right, do people have access to personal data and are they using it to create and train models, et cetera? And do we have the right controls on to restrict access so that people don't you know, leverage all our personal information that we hold on behalf of our customers to create new models? We are also seeing a trend, of course, there are some lawsuits, you know, New York Times, they sued Meta. Uh, companies are also banning the user API. They are also restricting API access. What is your take on these kind of, you know, measures that the companies are taking? What are the risks associated with that? I think it's the, well, firstly, I, I think these challenges that we're seeing now are the, the challenges that you always have with new technologies. You know, legislation, always takes a while to catch up with what's in place. And then you fall back on the existing copyright laws, et cetera, to, to wrap those up. Um, but it's also the challenge of the internet. Everything posted on the internet is accessible. 
Now, what has historically gone wrong is people, as we've seen with all these breaches with open public X3 buckets, what they put on the internet is not always what they intended to put on the internet because they, they suck at security sometimes. Um, so there's, there's that kind of challenge right now where we're still seeing the challenges of existing security models where people are struggling to figure out what is uh, being put on the internet and therefore they're relying on their existing legislation requirements such as copyright to enforce that. Um, you know, there's still some kind of challenges about, you know, making sure that you update your robots.txt um, kind of constraints to make sure that AI, AI LLM models can't read all that the data that you post on your website. So some of that is starting to, to catch up, but it's just the sign of new technology come on board and then all the pieces that are really there to enable the use of it securely and with a privacy centric view are still catching up with that. The longer term challenge of, you know, do we have the right regulation and the right controls in, in place uh, across this, I think is something that organizations are going to have to deal with individually. And we as an industry have to deal with uh, across the board to, to kind of wrap, you know, using someone else's data to create your, your own kind of art. Where does the boundary fit? Where does that commercial model beyond you know, paying back to the original creator on all those kind of things. I think that's something that is not going to be solved by technology, technologists on its own. It's going to be solved by an industry and by a lot of lawmakers across the, the own. But the value that we can kind of generate more broadly for society in applying these technologies shouldn't really outweigh some of that, like being able to apply LLMs and, and some of these technologies to really help healthcare more generally. That is something that as a society and an industry, I would absolutely support working through and making sure that we can push technology forward to solve some of that problem. That doesn't say that you can kind of just go gang ho forward for that. You actually have to make sure that you are working through the use of data ethically and working through some of those components. And that's where the legislation comes in to put the right guardrails across these organizations. I love the the way you, you use the term guardrails because sometimes what happens is that uh, because of these risks, of course, there's a lot of FUD also there and also lack of proper regulations where you really, I mean, why do we feel safe to fly in any American or I mean, some of the European airlines, because we know because of regulations, we know the planes will be safe as long as you're not flying in the max and the boards are loose. But it's still, you know, the, the point. Is, so uh, jokes apart is that regulation uh, because of the lack of regulations, because of the lack of tools, because of the lack of awareness, developers, operators, they they feel hesitant, you know, in leveraging these. So. Can you talk about how right tools, right regulation can build a guardrail so that developers are comfortable, they know that, hey, they are safe, they are protected, they are not crossing a line, and they can innovate, they can leverage some of these technologies. So talk about the importance of right tools, right practices, and of course, we are in the early phase of regulations, actually help companies with innovation. I love that analogy of guardrails and also seatbelts, and I'll get to that one as well, because uh, essentially the, the guardrails are there to, to keep people on the paved road, right? The, the paved road where you are making things easier for them to do the right thing, um, et cetera, and making sure that they don't leave that paved road because you know they're not seeing something, et cetera. Now, the right tools really enable those guardrails. So within the data privacy perspective and the data security space, some of those guardrails are putting in place uh, the right discovery tools and classification tools so that your developers know exactly what data is in what environments uh, and what with those kind of things that they go through the right approval steps to use that data. But it also allows you to make sure that you allow them access to data that doesn't have those privacy constraints across it. So, but that all starts from visibility into what data is in what environment and classifying it appropriately for what people can do with it. So who has access to it? The, the other kind of guardrail is keeping them within those environments, et cetera. But the seatbelt side of it is uh, more of on, on the security side. You know, if, 
if something goes wrong, if data ends up in an environment that it's not supposed to, how do you make sure that you're able to remediate that, pull them back as well? So the, that kind of concept of the seatbelt stopping impact from happening is, is also important. And those seatbelts might be, you know, watching the LLMs themselves and what information they share externally. So putting in place those right systems to both, you know, pro proactively reduce the amount of personal data in the privacy context in the, that the developers have access to, but then also wrapping those remediation tools and those detective and response tools to say, all right, now that we've got those in place, where is that output going? Where does that output come, come through? And does that output contain any personal information, et cetera? So it's both that proactive and responsive type tools that you will need to have within your environment. And we kind of do both of those at Symmetry, both the proactive remediation and reduction of um, kind of attack surface, so to speak, and that blast radius of what could go wrong if something went wrong and wrapping those kind of responsive tools around it. Now let's talk about the solutions. Uh, let's look at just Symmetry systems. How are you approaching this problem? And uh, is it all about tools or you also feel that teams do need proper practice, proper cultural change also? My kind of personal viewpoint on what we kind of uh, approach at Symmetry is, there's a reason it's called tools. <laughs> it's to enable people to do, to do things, right? Uh, a hammer without someone wielding the hammer is still just a hammer. So we, our kind of philosophy is we don't just provide the hammer and say, here's a hammer. We actually provide that hands-on support to make sure that we're giving them the right uh, tools and processes and working with them to drive outcomes. You, you can't just buy a hammer and say, there you go. We're actually there to, to help them kind of make sure that they are choosing the, the right hammer, making sure that they have the right tools. And that the approach that we take is, We'll help you develop your classification processes, help you identify what data is important to you, and then use the tools to classify that data automatically, et cetera. And then the outcomes that we want to drive are that wrapping those seat belts or those guardrails around it. So you help us define the policies that you want in place. If you say, I don't want developers ever to have access to social security numbers, we help you write that policy, implement that policy, and then you can immediately see uh, through those deterministic policies that no developer has access to that, or it will alert you if someone does and allow you to clean up either that access permission or that, that data, et cetera. Um, and then the responsive side is similar, right? We, we kind of say, okay, what don't you want to happen? You don't want data to be read by anyone from this environment because, or you want to be alerted when someone uh, reads data from this environment that has, you know, data that hasn't been touched for six months. That's probably a red flag that you want to be alerted on. So we work with people to, to kind of implement not just the tool, but also the processes to make sure that we drive the outcomes for you as a customer. Looking at some of the trends of adoption of AI, as you also rightly said, and none of us are, we are not cynic. We are more like, uh, you know, uh, you can say pragmatic also, but we have to balance it. Otherwise, that's when the problem starts. When we, our expectations either exceed or they are not right. We, uh, just like cloud, uh, AI, generative AI is not pixie dust. You just spray on it and all those problems will be magically solved. No. So looking at some of trends, how do you see the adoption of AI will go, grow in enterprise and also in production, not just evolution phase? And how you also see that there will be whole ecosystem like symmetry system to build guardrails around that so companies can leverage, they should actually be using them more without worrying about the drawbacks and risks. Definitely we've seen some trends in, in the industry already, right? Um, there's a couple of trends I'll, I'll point to and kind of show where it is. The biggest one that you've seen right now is the venture capitalists wholehearted adoption or kind of investment philosophy that AI is going to be the next big thing. The amount of money that's going into AI venture startups, both in cybersecurity, et cetera, or more broadly is astronomical, right? Um, everyone is on the investment side is uh, anticipating this will be a, a big thing. That means that you'll have a lot of competition in the space, a lot of investment, a lot of startups kind of spending money to, to kind of take the opportunity. On the adverse side, you know, 
what we've seen on the um, enterprise side or the, the corporate side as yet has still been very much, we are being quite cautious in our adoption of LLMs. We are looking for the right use cases and we are exploring it in the right kind of places. Um, a lot of the knowledge workers have adopted LLMs more broadly because it's cost effective to, to kind of right now, it's cost effective to use those tools to optimize their, their outputs, but they're making changes now to optimize some of their spend on people in those more creative fashions and, and use AI instead, because it's the cost effort balance against using AI versus or LLMs versus hiring three or four people to produce the same output in the same time is changing. That's based on the current cross model. How that's going to play out where you've got this huge expanse of um, investment in AI tools, companies being cautious on the adoption of, of AI, except for those knowledge workers and then reducing all of those kind of things. Uh, I think long term, we're going to start to see that you know, the, the hype get closer to what it is going to be long term. I think it's overhyped right now, but long term, it's going to boost and it's going to create this massive opportunity for the whole industry, for organizations, etc. So we'll start to see a lot more careful investment in LLM models within organizations. A lot of our customers are using us to prepare for that. They know that they want to use LLM for the benefit and the potential, and they, they're working through what are the right tools, processes, governance that we need to have right now to implement, to make sure that we can maximize our benefit from this new, techno benefit from this new technology. Claude, thank you so much for taking time out today to talk about you know, all these risks and the, the solutions that are available, tools that are available to folks, and also the importance of building the whole culture and practices there as well. Thanks for all those great insights, and I would love to chat with you again. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And, uh, you know, if any of your listeners want to find me, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm also, you know, available at symmetrysystems.com so they can find us on the, the internet, et cetera. So really appreciate your time and some of those insightful questions that we had. We'd love to keep chatting at some point.